Um, and I want to welcome Alessandro. Hi, everyone. Hi, Alessandro. So I'm I'm not an Italian native speaker, uh, so I would butcher your last name. Can you, can you pronounce your last name? Uh, Minocchi, Alessandro Min Minocchi. Minocchi. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, you describe yourself as a developer, as a father, as a geek, and you are an open source enthusiast. Um, what what is it that you like in open source? Uh, well, uh, to improve my uh, my skill and to help other projects to improve uh, the feature and uh, help other people with uh, this uh, open source library. Okay, that's great. What uh, open source libraries have you contributed to? Uh, a little bit of Doctrine, Badge Poser, and uh, I would like to start uh, with Symfony in a few months, I think, because I really love to contribute on this type of project. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for all your contributions because that helps every one of us. Um, so, your talk, you're going to be talking about uh, Symphony and hexagonal architecture. Um, why? <laughs> well, it's a very nice question, but uh, in these years I have seen a lot of projects that are blocked into all the version of the framework like Symfony 1 or Zen 1 with the impossibility to upgrade those. And uh, it's very important for me to share this architecture to help uh, these uh, teams and projects to improve. Okay, very much. I'm gonna give this, uh, thank you very much. I'm gonna give the stage to you and I'm looking forward to hearing about this. Okay, thank you. And uh, hi everyone. And today, as I said before, I talk about uh, Symfony and hexagonal arch architecture, and now this architecture can improve your projects. As I said before, I am Alessandro Minocchi, and I am a software developer in Flowing. And uh, as I said before, I'm a software developer. I usually work in PHP and Node.js. And you can also find me on Stack Overflow and Twitter with this uh, nickname, Minompi. So, my expectation today is to share to you my experience and uh, why I found this uh, hexagonal architecture useful for my workflow and for my projects. I think that you don't have to take uh, this talk like a set of rules. Instead, I hope that you can understand why it's important to know this architecture. And after that, thinking about is for you or not, for your projects or for your team. Now, Let's start with a real story that uh, many of you already lived, I think. A new application is coming, a new Greenfield application is coming. And for me, it's very uncommon because usually I work in a legacy project, but sometimes it happens. So with this uh, new application, you can uh, create a new from the zero application with the latest framework of Symfony, for example, with new libraries, your approaches, whatever you want, and you are really excited for it. But business usually asks uh, to create uh, in a rapid way the software because there is a strict deadline. And usually to develop in a rapid way, a developer can uh, install Symfony with Composer, installing the skeleton project, removing the demo code, auto-generate entities, start coding from controllers or auto-generate those, and they are ready to develop the application. After that, you can uh, add the new libraries, whatever you want. And for your application, you find the perfect library, the perfect external services. And uh, you can uh, add this without thinking about uh, the behavior and how to abstract it because you are, you are thinking that this is perfect forever. But six months later, that service is deprecated or you have found a new cheaper service for example and now you have to migrate the new to a new service you have to replace the service with a new one and you have written a lot of code and you have to change a lot of lines of code and uh, how many points inside the code do you need to change to replace that service you are trying to search in all over the code base to find the where you call that service. And you find 42 different places in all over the code base. 
and 42, it's not a random number, you know. For example, inside the payment controller, you are calling the method pay of your, your bank gateway service, or inside the payment service, you are instantiating your bank gateway service and call the method pay, or inside the model, you are instantiating again your bank gateway service and call the method pay with another with other arguments, for example. Believe me, this, situ this situation exists and uh, you can find a lot of projects like that. And uh, I think uh, that this situation exists because uh, many developers think that the framework is a classic MVC, model view controller, without thinking about the domain first. Because you have to develop uh, the application in a rapid way without thinking that you are adding technical depth. If it's a POC, a proof of concept, uh, or an experiment, it's okay, because whenever you want, you can take this project and put it into the trash. But if it's not that situation, it's not the best practice for me, because you are adding a lot of technical debt to the software, because you are adding, uh, you are coupling domain and framework together, and it's very common. And the problem exposed before is very common, and a common cause it's, is that for me. Developers thinking too early about the solution and, don't, and not about the domain behaviors. So if you don't think about the domain, the behaviors, you are guided from the framework with these kind of problems. Impossible to upgrade framework and vendors because everything is coupled and it's very difficult to upgrade because you have to touch the business logic inside the domain. Cost of maintenance, because if you need to change something, you take a lot of time because everything is coupled. Developers are not motivated because the stack is very old for the reason of point one. If you are working on a software of 10 years ago, it's not so motivating for you because usually developers would like to try new libraries, new PHP features, okay? Not maintainable application because everything is coupled, as I said before a lot of technical depth. Usually, when you recognize that there is technical depth, you don't fix it. You create a card into a Kanban board, hoping that someone uh, will take it. But often, that card is still there forever. So when you recognize that you are adding technical depth, try to fix it inside your feature branch or finish your feature branch, and after that, immediately fix the technical depth don't procrastinate it. Another problem could be that it's impossible to change implementation easily because everything is coupled. If you need to replace a service, you have to touch the business logic and you are scared about it, I think. Oh, me. So what really matters in software for me? For me, the real value of the software is your domain the business logic, not the framework. I really love Symfony, but you need to treat it as a tool, not the main core of your software, because what really brings value in software is the solution to the specific problem in the domain. Is the domain the real value of your software, the logic that you implement to solve a problem? It's not essential which type of database you will use or libraries you will use. They are implementation details and your domain doesn't need to care about it. For that reason, there is an architecture that can help you to build maintainable software, the Xagno architecture. This architecture was invented and published in 2005 by Alistair Cockburn in an attempt to avoid undesired dependencies between layers and contamination of user interface with uh, business logic. And now I would like to read for you the exact definition of this architecture for Wikipedia. The hexagonal architecture divides a system into several loosely coupled interchangeable components, such as the application core, the database, the user interface, test scripts, and interfaces with other systems. This approach is an alternative to the traditional layered architecture. Now, when I read and explain this uh, definition, the most common question is, 
Is it an over engineer strategy? Well, I think it's not an over engineer strategy. I think it's a different mindset, a different approach. You need to think more a lot first to understand the domain, the behaviors, how to divide in context, how many contexts you have, define ports and adapters. You need to think more about a class name, what is its right place. But this architecture allows you to create the couple code. Let's make an example of coupled code. You have a service called payment where uh, inside it, there is a method do payment with an object request. And inside the method, you, have, uh, you are instantiating your bank gateway service and call the method pay. Now, in this uh, class, there are a lot of problems for me. For example, the first is the request object because uh, I represent uh, an HTTP web request. And so if you would like to call this service from a click command, you can't. You need to duplicate this code or change something. Another problem is that you are instantiating your service with New York Bank Gateway. And if you would like to replace that service, you need to change in all over the code base all, li all the lines like that. A lot of effort you need to, uh, to apply. So how to decouple this code? First, you can create an interface, for example. This is an approach. You can uh, create an, an interface gateway provider that uh, needs a, a method pay with an object money, not the object request, a specific object, a value object in this case. And now you can create a, your bank gateway service that implements that interface with a method pay. And inside your payment service, you are using the dependency injection, injecting the interface, not the implementation directly. And inside the do payment method, you are calling the pay method of your service. Or in, now, if you would like to replace that service, you have to change the configuration, for example, not this class, okay, or business logic. So why is it important to decouple your code? Because as you have seen before, Coupling domain and framework has the dark side effect to create not maintainable application. And for maintainability, I mean the reduction of the absence of technical depth. And in my opinion, there are some points that helps you to understand if that application is maintainable or not. For example, changes in one part of an application should affect as few other places as possible. You need to change only a specific part, not in all over the code base. Adding features shouldn't require to touch any part of the code base. If you need to add something, you don't have to change other parts, right? Adding new ways to interact with the application should require as few changes as possible. Debugging should require as few workarounds. If you need to add a lot of workarounds, you can have a bad smell of not maintainable application. And testing should be relatively easy. When you test a class and uh, you take a lot of time, for example, you can have the bad smell of not maintainable class or software in this case, because usually that class can have uh, too many responsibility, for example. And single responsibility is the best practice for me to have clean and maintainable code and software. But single responsibility is also for the architecture, because what changes for the same reason should be grouped together. For example, code related to the framework should be grouped together. For example, in the infrastructure layer directory, code related to the specific service should be grouped together in a specific context, for example. Code related to the domain should be grouped together inside the domain layer. So we are saying that there is an important distinction between domain and infrastructure. You can also have the application layer, as Neil said before, but this is not the main focus of this talk. So for domain, I mean a directory where inside you can have models like entities, value object aggregates, interfaces for boundary objects. Inside the application, you can have use cases. Inside the infrastructure, you can have the framework code, implementation for boundary objects, web controllers, and 
click comments. So why is it so important to have maintainable software? For the reason explained before, in my opinion, there are a lot of man not maintainable projects. There are many big software that requires a lot of effort to update vendors or frameworks, and sometimes it's impossible. Those projects can have security problems, issues, and speed problems. And year after year, it's very difficult to find developers that can work with your stack and, as, and uh, have a motivated person inside your team. Another most common question is why an hexagon? For me, it's not important the number of sides. It can be six, 12, 20. The important is to understand that each side is a port into or out of our application. And each port can be used by adapters to make our system works fine. Let's dive into the ports, for example, because ports are like contracts. They are only definition of what we would like to do. They are not saying how to achieve them. And usually ports are inside the domain layer. And we can have input and output ports or primary and secondary ports. An input port, it's a simple interface that can be called by output components and that is implemented by a use cases, for example. They say this is the way that you can talk from the external to the domain, to our domain. In this case, this is an interface called the pay order handler with a method handle. In this case, it's supposed to use a command bus, for example. An output port is again a simple interface that can be called by our use cases if they need something from the outside. In this case, it's again inside the domain layer. We have the interface user repository with those methods, save and find all, that interact with something else. Now, adapters. Adapters are very concrete and contain uh, low-level code and are by definition decoupled from their ports. They are the implementation of our ports and usually adapters are inside the infrastructure. Inside the adapters, you have the real code to interact with external services, for example. As ports, we can have input and output adapters for each port type. This is an example of an adapter, MySQL user repository that implements user repository interface our user repository interface inside the domain with those methods save, find by D, and find all. Inside those methods, you have the real code to interact with an external database, in this case, MySQL. With this schema, you can see that uh, you can call our input adapters inside the infrastructure layer from HTTP request or click command. Our input adapters implements our input ports inside the domain. In the other side, we have output adapters that implements our output ports inside the domain to interact with external services like database or something else. This is an example of a directory structure. Inside SRC, we have two contexts, payment and cart, with the distinction of domain, application, and infrastructure. Now, if you combine uh, hexagonal architecture and dependency inversion, inversion principle, you can improve a lot your projects because the dependency inversion principle means that high level modules shouldn't depend on low level modules. Both should depend on abstraction. For example, an infrastructure class can depend on application and domain class. An application class can depend on domain class, but can depend on infrastructure class and domain can depend on infrastructure and application class. And what are so the advantages of using hexagonal architecture? For me, there are a lot of uh, advantages. The first, for example, is uh, the increasing of testability because you have decoupled your code and many parts of the code doesn't need a database connection, internet connection or file system. So you can create a lot of unit tests. You can create a very big suite of unit tests. And we love to write, to write unit tests, right? Another advantage could be that you can replace an implementation without affecting the domain. 
So you can change an adapter without touching the domain. You can touch only the infrastructure, the adapters. For example, you can replace a service with another one without touching the domain, the business logic, only adapters inside the infrastructure layers. Another advantage could be that uh, you can postpone the choice of vendors, databases, and servers. I mean, it's more important to model your domain in the first part of the project. So you need to know to more to have more knowledge when you need to make that choice. Uh, for example, of the database, you can choose uh, choose Mongo, uh, Elastic, MySQL for your database. And the domain doesn't care about how to store data exactly. So postpone when you can, because you need more knowledge about the domain, about the behaviors, to make the perfect choice at the moment. Another advantage could be that uh, you can update vendors and framework without touching your domain code. As I said before, if you decouple your code, you can update vendors and framework in a very easy way without touching the business logic. You have to change something, yeah, but not the domain. Another advantage, you can create maintainable application. Many software are blocked into framework version, old framework version, like Symfony 1, Dand 1, Symfony 2, and it's very difficult to upgrade those or to work on it because everything is coupled and it's very, very difficult. Let's make a concrete example. Uh, this is a simple, simple example uh, where, as you can see, there is a SRC legacy. And outside uh, the, this directory, we have created an SRC directory with a distinction of two contexts, payment and user. Pay attention, this is an approach. There are many other approaches. Inside the user context, we have application, domain, and infrastructure distinction. And for example, inside the infrastructure, you can have command, controller, and repository. Command and controller can also be inside the application. It depends. A MySQL user repository inside the infrastructure implements our user repository interface inside the domain where we have our model aggregate. And inside the application, you have the application service that orchestrate uh, to call the repository and to create, for example, a model. So, for example, inside the user controller, you can have a method called the save action, and you can you can create a DTO, a data transfer object, and pass it to our application service, create a user service. And inside that service, you are using the dependency injection, using the interface injecting the interface, not the implementation directly. And inside the method create user, you are taking the data transfer object and create in a valid way your user with an image constructor. And after that, you can save it using the interface. And somewhere you have a configuration or an auto wiring to say which type of repository are you using. When to use it? this architecture. Uh, when you have a new project, when you need to develop a new context into a legacy application, always, well, it depends, but I have found this architecture for, useful for the most of the project that I'm working on. And uh, if you try to apply this architecture, it's very difficult to come back and you can see a lot and a lot of benefits, I think. But how about legacy code without hexagonal architecture? Usually, when I approach uh, a legacy application without this architecture, I try to explain uh, to the team uh, the advantages of this architecture. And often, for new features, new contexts, we try to create uh, after, uh, in, not inside the, the legacy code, out of the legacy code, another directory with the distinction of domain, application, and infrastructure. And step by step, we can try to migrate the application to this new architecture. And every time you migrate something, you can follow a golden rule, the Boy Scout rule. Leave your code better than you found it. And where can you start from to 
have a, a more clean uh, code for your software using more interfaces, for example, or and using dependency injection, injecting the interface, not the implementation directly. Practice with Kata projects. Kata projects are side projects that you can create by yourself to test new libraries, framework, approaches. For example, I have made the Trist game in 20 different ways to try new things, framework, approaches, library, whatever you want. And when you have to understand well this architecture, you can apply it into real projects. Next improvement for your project could be the DDD, Domain Driven Design, as Neil said before, CQRS, Common Query Responsibility Segregation, Event Sourcing, TDD, and BDD. All these approaches, methodologies can improve a lot your code, your software, and uh, to summary, with hexagonal architecture allows you to have a, a maintainable software and uh, make your life better as a software developer. So if you want to try a new experience into a medic company, send us your CV and we will answer it to you in a very few days because we are hiring. Please share your feedback on JoinedIn to improve me as a speaker and to improve my talk for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Um, so let's see if anyone has any questions, please leave them in the stage chat and I will keep an eye on that chat. Um, let's first start with uh, a question. Um, so these practices that you've been talking about, um, you've been talking about doing a whole application in this way. Is there a way to do that uh, just for a small part of the application? Yeah, I apply this architecture in a specific part, for example, because uh, we have a crowd application, but uh, there is a specific part, very complex, and uh, we have taken this part into another directory and, and uh, try to apply the hexagonal architecture with success. And uh, okay, this so you can, can improve a lot. Yeah, so you can take uh, that a specific part that is very complex and then leave all the simple stuff to the to the standard structure. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of what you've been saying, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so why do you think that, for instance, in the Symphony documentation, uh, this way of doing things hasn't been promoted a lot? Well, uh, I think that it's not promoted a lot because uh, uh, it's uh, an approach, a mindset, like domain-driven design. It's not so easy to apply this architecture as a standard because there are not uh, uh, explicit rules or a, a standard to apply to all your projects. So Symfony documentation explain how to build a Symfony project, but the approach is, is a different thing for me. But uh, I think that we can... Uh, improve the documentation with some uh, link to apply this architecture or other approaches, I think, like DDD, because it's very useful for your projects. So you mentioned earlier that uh, you wanted to start contributing to Symfony. Maybe this would be a good starting point. Yeah, this is a good idea, I think. OK. Um... I don't see a lot of uh, questions coming in, uh, Barrett. There are a lot of people that are very positive about this talk. Uh, they, they thank you a lot. And uh, Fabio says, I love these concepts and well exposed to. So uh, Alessandro, thank you very much uh, for, for sharing your knowledge with us here at SF Day. Thank you.